Thanks for listening to this episode of the Coffee and Technology Podcast. In this episode, we speak with Henry Wilson. Henry is the founder of Perfect Daily Grind and the producer Roaster Forum. Perfect Daily Grind is a digital coffee publication that is available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. The producer Roaster Forum is a global forum that connects coffee producers and coffee roasters worldwide in host origin countries to promote and enable trade in coffee. Henry discusses his experiences and the need for accessible coffee education, the importance of technology on the production side, and the importance of producers' ability to market themselves as more than just a supplier, but also a brand. Listen to the unique industry perspective that Henry brings to the table. Yo, Norbert, how's it going, man? Welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> Good, Nick. I'm excited to be here, as always. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Um, I'm excited for our next guest today. And with that, I'd like to welcome Henry Wilson from Perfect Daily Grain. How's it going, man? Yeah, I'm really well, thanks. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. It's exciting to have you here, and I'm excited to do this episode with you. Just to kind of jump straight into it, um, you know, you're pretty well known worldwide because of what you've done with Perfect Daily Grind, but it'd be really great if you could tell us a little about your your journey starting Perfect Daily Grind and also what it took to to build that and and what you've experienced in, throughout your time in coffee. Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, thanks again for having me on the show. It's a real privilege to be here. And um, let me know if I go into too much detail, if it gets boring. <laughs> but um, in relation to Perfect Daily Grind or PDG, I started it, I was just checking around eight years ago. Okay. And initially I created the publication purely because I spent a lot of time going back and forth from Latin America. And I distinctly remember, in, I remember visiting producers and seeing a lot of things that they did in relation to how they produced their coffee, how they processed it and their day-to-day -day lives. And then going back to the UK where I'm originally from, I noticed that this information just wasn't available. So there was a big information gap kind of between what farmers were doing at an origin level and then what coffee professionals say in consuming countries were aware of. And similarly also I noticed that producers weren't that aware of like all of the coffee shop trends, all of the industry trends taking place say in the US and in the UK. So initially I started Perfect Daily Grind predominantly for myself just to document what I saw and to address an information gap between what producers were doing and what say the industry was aware of. And I started it as a blog. So I think it was like perfectdailygrind.wordpress.com <laughs> with like an atrocious design. It was really hideous, but I was really proud of it. And I kind of gradually grew it, predominantly using social media. So this was a time when like Facebook was really, really big. And if you got the right content, it would go viral on, on Facebook. And it's, it originally started, say, documenting what I saw in coffee producing countries. And then based on the analytics of the articles, uh, we kind of shaped our editorial around that. So if we know, we, and we built a pretty solid audience of coffee roasters and of cafe owners when we started, because there just wasn't that much information available. Um, currently, as we stand, we have, we do a minimum of five articles a week hmm. and we have independent editorial. So we're not doing translations in Spanish and Portuguese. So we have separate editors there that have their own editorial calendar, their own structure they follow and style. And the focus for me is adding value. So we don't just wanna be commenting on what's happening in the sector or publishing press releases for us. What we really wanna be doing is looking at what's happening and adding our perspective or summarizing the perspective of a number of industry professionals to provide valuable educational content. And that's always what's driven us. It's never been a case of, well, let's just write about this because everyone else is writing about it. it. Has to be, well, how does this add value to this particular sector within the industry? And and yeah, and kind of we've scaled it over the last few years, and it's gone from being me sitting in my room writing a, a blog post with like a thousand exclamation marks to, <laughs> having, to having a team of editors who manage the editorial calendar and working with amazing brands and amazing people. That's awesome. Yeah, I know it's, it's awesome to hear you say that, um, say adding value, because one thing I've always noticed about your platform is that it's educational, you know, it's not just coffee news and it's not just coffee updates. Um, it actually truly adds value to the industry. And speaking of adding value, you know, if you can tell us a little bit about your producer roaster forum, I know that's been a big passion for you and it's grown substantially over the years. And I'd love for our listeners to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, I've always done what I enjoyed and where we've seen opportunities as a company to add value on. And on that note, so one of my colleagues who's originally from uh, El Salvador, we were chatting one day and we we're talking about all the different trade shows that he was expected to attend. 
And his reaction was like, these are awesome. I'm really lucky that I get to go to all these shows, but a lot of my family, a lot of my friends in the coffee sector just can't go. Mm. So we're like, why don't we just mm -hmm. do a coffee show, like a, a, I don't know, a latte art throw down in El Salvador. And he's like, well, people don't really do that. Like it's not normally local events. I was like, well, let's just try it. Let's, let's, let's do it. So draw up a plan. His name is Julio. And um, we can discuss it. And the initial focus for that was we would bring roasters to a coffee producing country and get them to stay with producers. Because at the time, that was, that was kind of all we had in terms of budget. And then we'd have maybe a few speakers and do an event which lasts a day, some educational activities, and then we'll kind of see how it developed. Um, fast forward, say four years, we've now done events in El Salvador, Honduras, uh, Brazil, and Guatemala. And the event has transformed and scaled quite a lot. So the last event, for example, I think we had about 150 roasters attending, staying with uh, in groups, of, and basically how it works is these roasters who are from across the world. So we have roasters from Saudi Arabia, we have roasters from Taiwan, from the UK, from all different origins um, and all different types of scales. So roasters who are buying containers of coffee to roasters who are looking for exclusive micro lots and smaller volumes. We make groups of 20. So roasters get to spend time with different people they wouldn't normally interact with, CEOs, for example. And they stay in farms for a couple of days, get to see the producers, learn about production, processing, all the things that happened on the farm. And then we have a two day forum, which is where everyone meets up. All of the roasters who've attended and been in farms in different parts of the country will meet up and uh, basically attend a forum or a trade show in the city. So in this year we're doing it in Medellin. We anticipate to have circa, I don't know, five, between a minimum of 5,000 people, but the event has space capacity for 8,000 people. And it's called the Producer Roaster Forum because our focus is adding value predominantly to producers was our initial focus, but through the direct involvement of roasters. So what we do is we analyze what do producers want to know about. So producers this year, we think want to know about RTD and the growth of that across the industry. Producers want to know about, say, what's happening in the Chinese market. We'll bring the best speakers to come and share expertise. We have simultaneous translation. And then we'll sort of work backwards. So it'll be like if a producer wants to learn about how to export coffee to China, we can have a presentation. But mm -hmm. does the producer have understanding of exportation? Do they have access mm -hmm. to finance? Okay, if they don't, we have to do training before the event. Who do we involve? And then we have training before the event for certain producers. And then it's like, what well, can the producers that we want to help afford to attend this event? Okay, if, they, if, if, if there's a particular percentage that can't, what can we do about that? And then we have a program where we'll pay their accommodation and food, for the event, we'll have the training beforehand. And it's a similar perspective as well with the roasters. So like, okay, this roaster comes and he really wants to buy coffee from this region, Colombia. He meets an amazing producer. What next? Do they mm. have understanding of exploitation? Do they understand the difference between farm gate and FOB? <laughs> do they buy coffee on spot? Is it full? And we'll do all these little things. And we'll try to fill in the gaps. So the event initially started as like a, a latte out throwdown in El Salvador, <laughs> now being an event with thousands of people where we have a trade show element, we have presentation element, and a big focus on education and workshops. Mm -hmm. And I think doing it in Colombia is really exciting because I feel like a lot of brands um, are now looking more and more to Latin America as a serious market. So not just, say, traders, but also espresso machine manufacturers, coffee group providers, and they want to have access to the market. They've got to find the people mm -hmm. to work with or even just gain some market intelligence. And, yeah. I mean... I didn't realize, but there's 550,000 coffee producing families just in Colombia. So it's mm. a pretty good place to start in terms of coffee culture. That's amazing. Uh, and that the whole concept of that event is, is like mind blowing, to be honest. Uh, that's a huge undertaking. Uh, how, how big is your team? So for the event, we have um, a minimum of three people working like full time on it before, yep. before, the, before. And then during the event, we'll involve team members from other parts of the company. So I have Perfect Daily Grind, the publication, and also the marketing mm -hmm. agency. And then part That's of the focus fantastic. as well is generating kind of opportunities and value and that origin. So we try to hire as many local people as possible, as well as providers. Mm -hmm. And I understand you're in Colombia right now. Yeah. So I'm in Medellin. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're getting ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Enjoying the Paisa lifestyle. I love it.
So one thing I'm curious in uh, about what you're doing is that um, you mentioned a lot about this idea of accessibility and educating producers and whatnot, and make, just making that information accessible across the supply chain. From when you started Perfect Daily Grind to now, what's changed in terms of the level of accessibility of information and what's made it possible for producers and just anyone across the supply chain to have more access to this information? Well, one thing that I noticed quite quickly is I heard it in a presentation on YouTube, but content is king, but distribution is queen, right? So mm. you can spend so long writing the most outstanding content, interviewing everyone, producing a masterpiece. But unless you have distribution, you're extreme. No one's going to read it. Mm -hmm. So we've always been digital, 100%. And that's because our focus is that we want anyone to be able to read us for free, wherever they are. And then also, when we, when we started Public Daily Grind, there was a, a massive kind of boom on social media and people were really, really hungry for information. So at the time, there wasn't that much information about coffee, ranging from production to roasting to running a cafe available for free online. Now I would say the market is a lot more saturated. So when you go on the internet, you're kind of inundated with information. Whether that's quality or not is a whole other thing. But, our folk, but the, the transformation we've seen is initially we were distributing predominantly on social media our articles because people wouldn't come directly to the site to find us. And now we have different ways that people are accessing their website. Could be through the newsletter, through being going direct through the internet, could be going through Google, could be visiting us via social. But everything we do has to be guided by data. So it can be kind of upsetting sometimes because you can work out like, what do people care about and what do they want to read? Mm. And for us, it's a balance. So if we were to just chase page views, it would be a website which would be full of how-to guides that have really long SEO value on Google. What mm. we're trying to do is we try to balance between content, which is, well, to get a lot of views, which people obviously want to read about, but also what we call thought leadership content. So content which is well-researched, well-thought-out, and forward-thinking, which people will read and engage with, but they're not going to get tens of thousands of hits but the right people will really enjoy it and will use it to inform what they do. Uh, but a really important thing that we've seen with Purple Daily Grind is that for content to be relevant, which is one of the most important words that we constantly use, it has to be adapted to the market which we're trying to speak to. Mm. So that was why we started PDG Espanol and PDG Brazil in Spanish and Portuguese, is that I didn't really like it that on PDG Espanol initially, we were just translating content from the English because I felt that basically the content was targeted to consuming countries and we were adapting. And that information was still interesting and useful and it got lots of page views. But also what we wanted to do was to kind of shift the dynamic in those, say, in, in the Latin American markets. So in Peter Espanol, we have a rule that on the publication, we're only allowed to interview um, native Spanish speakers in Latin America. We have a rule that all of the editorial staff have to be in Latin America. The editor has to be in Latin America because otherwise that content will be so strongly influenced by say what I think is what my colleagues think based in the UK that it might not be totally relevant. And like a how to guide for setting up a roastery in Germany is going to be very difficult for a, very different to a how to guide for someone setting a roastery in Mourinho, let's say in Colombia. Yeah. Um, towards the page, page views, you know, uh, I, I just thought uh, you could always uh, straw that uh, occasional funny cat video in so that uh, that balances maybe the outstanding content with page views and, <laughs> you know, get, get the, to, to a good result on both ends. <laughs> well, I, I, well, you say that we had a meeting earlier, like last week, because it seems like we're seeing the return of the meme or the meme, as they call it here in Colombia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, well, how do we address that? Yeah. Right. And right. then TikTok, which is changing lots of stuff now and is a totally different way of engaging and like I hear, I read, I hear, I hear a lot of like um what you do, you could you could be a, a company like what you are, but you also could be an NGO. Uh for for the same reason. Uh for, for the for what what you try to accomplish. Where do you find your your, your balance? It's like be, I, being a company, being for profit, uh, but also providing content for free. That's kind of, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a reverse business model, I guess, to it. Well, I mean, so the target for us is to have as many readers as possible in the publication. 
okay. um, who, who are of a target audience and then brands want to advertise because they want to be seen and they want so i wouldn't necessarily that is like a, i wouldn't say that's an ngo that's just the model that we chose because i i would like to think the people in the coffee industry be willing to pay for information but that would probably be thousands of people as opposed to millions of people and that's kind of numbers that we want to reach with the publication and then with pdg spaniel and pdg brazil they're not currently profitable those two publications but the idea is, is that we we sponsor that through the english language publication and the idea behind that is i've always just thought i enjoy it it's possible it adds value to the sector and i'm very confident that in the future the latin american markets will be more established coffee consumption will increase mm. and when the time's available when we have the time to do so we can build up more kind of presence and advertising opportunities on that Mm -hmm. It's sort of like an ecosystem that we have. So we have Juice Roaster Forum, we have Perfect Daily Grind publication, we're actually launching another publication later in the year, and we also have the marketing agency. So I see it that we want to raise awareness of ourselves as thought leaders and as providers of high quality educational content, and that will benefit everything that we do. Awesome. But yeah, the, I mean, I think you're the same though as well at Crops, right? You do a lot yeah, of yeah. things <laughs> and you're consistently thinking, well, how can we add value? And there's been a lot of exciting things you've done with, with producers as well. Right, right. No, absolutely. And that's why we, we, when we started out, we uh, got the ORG domain, right? Because we felt like we, we, we wanted to be a company for sure. And we liked that for the sustainable business model. So being a, being a commercial company gives you or it dictates a, a sustainable mo a business model, <laughs> but also in a way that it's not profit maximizing or, um, you know, fast sales. It's, it's really mission driven. I think that makes a little bit the difference. And uh, that's what I hear also from, from your end, like, mm. uh, you, you want to provide value. I think on the long run, this is actually what, 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 will, what will work and what works, um, and what changes the world, I think for the, for the better. And it's about, and I think it allows you to be more nimble and dynamic as well, because you can use, you can invest your own funds to do what you want and you can do tests and no one can say, well, that doesn't work according to the TDR or whatever agreement you have. You can just proceed and get it, get it to happen. Yeah. So I'm curious uh, because of sim it's similar to Cropster's story and Cropster's value propositions, perfect daily grind being that it's very mission driven, especially with the uh, PDG Espanol and PDG Brazil. What's the mental journey you've you've gone through or go through knowing that these efforts in Espanol and Portuguese will be profitable in the future? And and right now it seems like a long term approach that you're taking. What what do you what do you go through mentally to remind yourself that this is worth it in the long run and this is gonna be uh, truly a great success and you know great in the future? I mean you make it sound far more profound, I think, than it than it is, but like <laughs> <laughs> I think I the fo the focus for me in whatever I do it has to be that I enjoy what I do and I love what I do and my colleagues feel mm. proud of what they do they want to mm. come to work and with that I mean it's it's a no brainer like creating a, a Spanish language high quality publication similarly in Portuguese like mm -hmm. the industry needs it and the good thing when you have a digital product is that you can't fool yourself right so. If we're publishing articles in those languages, we know pretty quickly if no one cares because we're not going to get any reads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the thing that kind of keeps us going is that we publish an article and it performs outstandingly well and you get a reminder. And then you might get an email from someone saying, hey, I really, really enjoyed that. That was really cool. Or even now that I'm in AG and I'll go to a coffee shop, and someone will say, hey, we read you. And they call it Perfect Daily here for some reason mm -hmm. instead of <laughs> Perfect Daily Grind. But here they read it. And that for me is really, really satisfying. And it's, I mean, it's also thinking long-term, I'm quite young. So my focus is like not max to maximize profit extraction in the short term, mm. because I have many like decades of that I'm going to continue to be working and you want to continue to kind of do something which will be, well, or outlive you, you as well, but also kind of keep progressing. Mm. I think that one thing that maybe occupies me more is have to consistently like adapt and change because particularly say the digital landscape or and also in the media things are constantly changing so you have to really be on top of stuff like you make a joke that like oh yeah you need to make like a meme with cats but like if you look at the, even the media landscape the way people are communicating and sharing information is changing so quickly that you have to be really on it mm -hmm. yeah that's uh that's one of the fascinating things when you're very young 
because it's changing all the time and you like change, right? And that's, I guess, the, the older you get, the more challenging that becomes because you're, you you constantly have to reinvent. And if you're made made for that, it's fantastic. But if you're not made for that, that can really get to you. I think that's that's a little bit the thing. But I, I personally find change fascinating. And uh, that's why technology, right? I, I love technology also there. It's changing all the time. At the same time, uh, there's there's moments where I feel like, really, again? It's like we just changed this two, three years ago, and now we need to change it again. Or even yeah. even less than two years ago. <laughs> then it's really like, oh, my God, those technology frameworks or, I don't know, cell phones or some some technologies, they go so fast, right? Screen mm. sizes. Suddenly, your content needs to be adjusted to people. Or I mean, that, that, that was the big shift to the, to the cell phones, right? Everything was on a big screen or on a, on a decent screen. And you had space for stuff, and then suddenly, oh no! Now everybody looks at it at a, at a super small screen, and now you have to change <laughs> everything. How to like portion that information? I, I guess I mean that's the same for media, right? Now you, everybody reads you on on them, or a lot of people read you on your on their mobile devices. Yeah, I mean, like this weekend, I stayed in a hotel um, near Watape, which is like an hour and a half outside of Medellin, mm -hmm. and I arrived at the hotel. And then they said to me, okay, here's our WhatsApp number. If we need anything, whether it's say room service, um, any issue with the room, you WhatsApp us. I WhatsApp them. <laughs> they respond to me with a voice note, like two minutes long, a soliloquy explaining what could have been answered in three or four words about everything. And so as a result of that, we had a call this morning and we're making a plan for producer roaster forum. So we anticipate say 3,000, 4,000 producers should attend. And it's like, well, I want to do the promotion and the interaction with the ring via email because it's better and I like it for me. Like I can manage my email. But right. what we're thinking now is we're going to have to do a broadcast list for WhatsApp and have the interaction with the producers via WhatsApp, which I can say we're not going to do that. But if we don't, we're not going to be able to reach the orders we want and connect with them. And it's kind of like, I find it frustrating because I'm like, I don't want to do business via WhatsApp. But that Latin America even has its, in, in Colombia has a certain way of using these platforms that <laughs> people in London wouldn't like. Yeah, I agree. I've seen this all the time, which is very nice when you can WhatsApp. Um, I mean, all the business contacts in Latin America, you WhatsApp them or whatever messages they, they use now with Telegraph and all those other things, um, Telegram. Um, but uh, I would never be able to do that in, in Europe. It's like, no, it's not, not a thing. <laughs> it's email or call. Yeah, no, it would be rude, almost rude. Like if I some just WhatsApp someone, but then again, also that there's there's blurry lines. A lot of people who do international business from Europe also is like, yeah, WhatsApp me. It's like, oh my god, really? That was just the CEO of a big German company gives me his WhatsApp <laughs> number and asks me to WhatsApp him <laughs> instead of a formal, um, you know, <laughs> uh, email or something. And yeah. Yeah, it's super cool how this how times change. Speaking on this point of the way people receive certain messages or, or the way certain commun communications are sent across to people, different people of the world, you mentioned this point of data. And I'm wondering, based on all the data that you've gathered and seen from Perfect Daily Grind, what's what has changed or how have or how have you seen uh, the trends and the way people consume content? You know, what was it like before and what is it like now? Well, I think the obvious thing is the difference between desktop and mobile. Okay. Right? And so there's been a shift more and more to people reading more and more news on their phones. And if you think about it, that's probably what most of us do. You're like you wake up in the morning, you look at stuff on your phone. And that also has a reflection of how people read content because people won't also always be reading something from start to finish on their phone. They'll kind of scan, read it, and extract the key points of information and take it from there. And another thing that's interesting that I've seen change over the last few years is initially the social media platforms who used to be a significant part of our inbound traffic to the publication, not so much now. Um, initially, they would be drivers um, to the website. So you put something on Facebook, people would then click through and reach the website. If you go on TikTok, I don't know how active you guys both are, <laughs> but the aim of that platform is to keep you on there as long as possible. Like It's pretty difficult to go off. <laughs> Same thing with Instagram, the way they're changing the algorithms is they don't really want you to click the link in the bio and go off. And even if you do, you're actually still within the Instagram platform mm. on your phone. So they count it as like Instagram duration time. So I think that what we're finding more and more is that 
before you could kind of create content, put it on the website, and all the other channels, so social media, use that would actually direct people towards that. Now what we find is that we have to be okay with the fact that people that consume us, say, on Instagram, a lot of them probably won't click through to the website. So we have a choice. Like, do we try and change the way we structure the articles to kind of force people? They have to find, to get more information. They have to go on our website. Or do we just accept that that's a different channel and we put the information on there and we're cool that people aren't on there, which has implications as well for advertisers because that means that how do we get content on there? Um, and there's, there's lots of small changes occurring like that. But I think that like more and more we have to create content for each platform, which is more kind of exhausting on time and resources. Because we now say within, say, the agency as well, we now have three full-time graphic designers. So we're constantly having to design stuff, change images. And it's a constant work in progress. And I think we there was it, it goes through in like stages because we saw like a big drive like a couple of years ago for like really refined high quality video content and we saw a lot of beautiful videos of people in farms with a drone all this stuff that mm -hmm. was very in and now we're seeing that there's like this focus on authenticity where you kind of have the CEO of a company standing behind their phone just kind of talking casually mm -hmm. and it kind of goes in waves one thing that I'm trying to work out is like, what do the next generation of consumers content actually look for? And like, and there was an article, I think in the wall street journal, which said that in December, the, um, there were more searches or more time spent on the time spent on TikTok and on Google, which I don't, I can't, it kind of blew my mind when I was reading that. Yeah. But I think it's also partly where the platform is structured, like Google, you'll go on, you'll search something, you'll leave TikTok, mm -hmm. you'll go on for two minutes and you're like two hours later, you're like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's an intense picture what you're drawing here, um, and it's quite uh, complex for for brands. So if you if you if you talk about that aspect of it a little bit, what what will brands have to do to be successful on on you know on on, on your on your on your media or in general? Yeah, so we actually have PG Media. We run and work with a number of different brands on their social media strategy. So ranging from coffee cook fries to coffee associations. So we have a diverse kind of view of what people are doing. I think the simple thing with some of these platforms is to think, well, we just won't do it because it will pass and like we'll just focus on what we do, what we do. But I think that really, like um, you can't ignore them because some of the platforms will come and go, but some of them will stay. And if you can get in there early, you can establish a loyal audience mm. and you can also take advantage of essentially the algorithms, which will give you much larger organic reach at the beginning. So if you go, for example, we're not experts in TikTok, but I've been studying over the last few weeks. And it's like, uh, you can do a post on TikTok, you have 100 followers, you can get a reach of 1500 people. On Instagram, you can have 10,000 followers and you'll get a reach of 100 people because there isn't that much content on TikTok. TikTok tries to encourage people to do so, so it maximizes the organic reach of the content. Mm. Similar to LinkedIn, like you may well have seen over the last, say, two years, LinkedIn all of a sudden has had this boom because it's been a much higher push for organic content. Mm -hmm. So I think for brands, is it's two things. It's about creating content for the platform and for the audience. Mm. So the LinkedIn audience, the people that consume content on LinkedIn, are different to the people that consume content on Instagram um, and TikTok. So you have to kind of adjust the content to meet that. So it might be the length of the of the post it might be the image you use it might be the the even the voice you use mm -hmm. and also i think you have to really be on the top of it so you have to be looking at like what's next because it's much easier to be first than to be the best on those platforms mm. enjoying this episode of the coffee and technology podcast this podcast would not be possible without the support of cropster whether it's tracking harvest yields roastery and inventory management or simply tracking brew recipes, Cropster Origin, Cropster Roast, and Cropster Cafe can help you streamline your workflows and help you operate more efficiently. Yeah, so on this topic of social media, I know you've um, done some work in helping a lot of producers um, you know, really utilize social media to their benefit and helping them not just you know, be able to sell their coffee, but also help them sell a brand, create a brand within, within themselves you know, and, and have a little bit more access and visibility in the market beyond the port um can you touch a little bit about on your work on on that front 
I mean, we have some workshops that happen every year at the Producer Restaurant Forum, and occasionally we'll do other events which sort of will incorporate an element of tra training on WhatsApp or, sorry, social media. And I think the key thing is that social media for producers that might not have the time or resources to build a website or even the expertise, social media is a far more accessible tool and you have a captive audience on there of coffee roasters who are interested and engaging and looking for information about coffee production processing. Social media is a really good way that a producer can differentiate themselves and essentially build a brand. Because you can go to many different coffee producing countries in many different countries, in many different places, and at a glance, the producers can seem similar. They might produce the similar same variety, might even be at similar altitudes at the same time. Hmm. And then when you actually speak with the producers and they explain to you what they do, how they do it, their approach, ranging from pro processing to philosophy to their story, that's a lot what adds value. And I think that it's really, really important for producers to invest in branding and marketing and documenting what they do, whether that be on social media or on other platforms, because it enables them to build differentiation so that people or roasters or green coffee buyers want to buy from them because they know that there's something different or exceptional about what they do. Because if producers just produce, say, an 82 cup standard, minimal defects, and just sell their coffee low to a local mill or a co-op, then they have a greater chance of being replaced or someone can always probably find a cheaper coffee than them and they'll, they, could, they could lose their market. But if they can actually build a brand for themselves and be known for certain things, then they're in a much stronger position. And similar the way that like the traders rely on the roasters demanding the coffee, the roasters demanding the consumer that's looking for a certain coffee. And I also think that producers are in like a, a fortunate position as well, where I would say the, it's not, we're not that saturated with information about what happens on, on, on coffee farms. So if they produce good content, people will read it and will be engaged with it. I think one thing that, that producers have to consider as well is that what do people actually want to find out about and what's interesting. And the good thing about social media is if you do a post which isn't interesting, you can't fool yourself because I have no likes and no engagement. If you do a post which is interesting, then you're rewarded with more views. And I also think it comes down to availability and accessibility. Like if producers are available on a platform, it means that they can be contacted by anyone and have that direct dialogue. And in the past, it would have been very difficult to interact directly with a producer in a certain region or town. And the idea now is that you can just ping them a message, chat, and find out what's going on. Very fascinating. And, and stuff I have I've thought about for the last 20 years, <laughs> how, how that communication can be effectively working between producers and roasters, but then even further uh, consumers, right? That, that's the dream, in my opinion, mm. that roasters uh, that producers connect to to uh, coffee drinkers and vice versa but we have so there's a lot of layers of translation kind of necessary we have if uh, of course the language barrier we have also cultural differences how important are those or is this because because facebook and all those social media platforms are global and now everybody kind of accepts there is different cultures and content might be in a different language and it's okay to google translate where do, you, where do you see those that, that kind of limitations, but also the opportunities? Mm. I think it comes down to like relevance as well. Like the person creating the content, the individual, whether it's the producer or the roast, has to be very considerate of who do they want to read that content and what are those people interested in. And I agree with you with things such as language. It is a limitation and it is unfortunate. But if a producer wants to sell coffee directly to a roaster in the US and doesn't speak English, they're at a massive disadvantage. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you see and, the same, that's, that's problematic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what we also learned through the Producer Roaster Forum, the initial premise was we'll connect roasters with producers, happy days. <laughs> Let's just do business, because that's what everyone was saying, direct trade. Let's put the producer and the roaster together. Right. They'll be really good friends. They'll just buy coffee. He'll pay him in cash or whatever. He'll leave the coffee over his shoulder, take it on the plane, easy. What, what we actually found was that a lot of the time we'd introduce producers with roasters, that producer had never sold coffee anywhere rather than say their local mill where they long standing relationships and who may even be financing their operation mm. of the farm. And then we, then a roaster arrives from say, I don't know, let's say Japan. And then they just chat 
and then and then but what we what we found is that the producer didn't really know how to export the coffee didn't have experience of that mm -hmm. and similarly the roaster was used to buying the coffee on spot from a local trader in the sea from in japan and it was a yeah. it was a big informational kind of gap or big observation that we noticed was that like initially the industry has presented it as a threat sometimes that like these two groups never talk because if they did like all the greedy people in the middle that were taking the money um, <laughs> would disappear. But what we found when we did the event is that every circumstance is unique. So often nothing would happen unless we had, say, a facilitator, a logistics provider, a trader right. there who could not only make sure that trade could happen, but also assist on financing all these elements. So I think that it's not just a case of like, ah, oh, information, those two people can talk. I think it's a case of like um, looking at what each party is doing on the supply chain and what's lacking on that. Because it was really interesting. Like we genuinely thought, and we, I was a little bit deflated um, when we did the PRF in Guatemala because we had a big dinner where we took out all of the producers who were um, scholars. So basically they had their accommodation and food sponsored. Mm -hmm. And it was sponsored by a roastery in the US called uh, Mayorga Organics. Mm -hmm. And we went to dinner, went to the best restaurant in Guatemala. We're like, this would be we can't necessarily do something incredible for the group of producers and generate long-term commercial relationships in the space of like two days. So let's just go for a really amazing dinner and we'll invite a few roasters who will attend. And at the very least, we can ensure that these producers will sell some coffee or at least one or two of them will sell coffee to these roasters. I spoke to the roasters kind of at the side and they said, look, we'll buy two containers of coffee each. This is sort of what we're looking for. Um, this sort of profile, um, yeah. And I remember one of the roasts said to me, basically, I'm looking for an 83 cup, clean, uh, nice social um, impacts with the coffee, um, really not too fussy. We, we then sat down that roaster with a group of producers at the dinner table, whenever I was having dinner, and through one of my colleagues who was translating, kind of explained what were his needs in terms of coffee. He was looking for this, right? After he explained it, which was what I just said, we asked the table, who here has coffee that, that, um, that this roast to be interested in. No one lifted out their hand. We're like, let, let us rephrase that, right? He's looking for an A3 cup coffee, um, nice social impact, uh, not too bothered about specific flavor notes, just has to be a clean cup. No one raised their hand again. We then asked them, we're like, what's the issue? And like one of the farmers kind of sheepishly put up their hand and they're like, well, we don't really do social projects because like we don't have the resources to like build schools. And, we're like, what? and then we realized that this roast that was presenting his idea of like social impact was just those producers' lives. He was like, I'd like you to work well with your family, to pay good prices to your team, and just to have a big, a, a strong positive impact locally. And then we realized that they were like, well, yeah, of course we do that. That's, yeah. that's, that's our lives. And we, I just noticed there was an information gap there. So it wasn't just like putting a roast with a producer and then leaving. There were little things like that. And things like constantly kept happening at events. So sometimes we put a producer with a roaster and the producer, because they didn't really know how much they could charge for their coffee, was like, I want hundred dollars a pound. Because, mm. and then it was like, well, we have to calibrate here. Who normally calibrates? <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Those are very interesting and meaningful, I think, events uh, for, for identifying those like information gaps, but also enable learning on both sides, right? how everybody thinks about um the, the, the other part and you know that and also the middle like the the middle layer how important that actually is and all the services which are offered in terms mm. of like logistics and financing and translation and cultural translation and and so many other things right i uh i think it's very uh, and that, that that doesn't it's not only the coffee supply chain there's there's many things where you where you feel like oh because you don't know what someone does, you assume it's not important <laughs> mm. uh, or just because it's uh, it's expensive and you don't know exactly why. And, and I think that's the transparency we're talking about. Once you get into the into the know, it's like, oh, wow, importers, exporters, they actually do a lot of things. And uh, I mean, some charge more, some charge less. And depending on transparency and all that, uh, there's a lot of differences. But um, now they know right and uh, i think that's what i've seen a lot with direct trade that the farmer and the roaster they would talk to each other and they would kind of 
want to do trade, but then they talk to their facilitators and mm. basically task them with making it happen. Mm. And that, that is also a, a, a huge step forward, in my opinion. And I think scalability is something that we have to consistently be addressing in freshly coffee. Is like, what makes sense? Mm -hmm. like if you're buying a certain volume for a certain amount of money, of course, do it. Yeah. It's like in any business, probably not unique to coffee, just that what I, what, what I work in, is there has to be a minimum amount or a, a minute for it, for it to really make sense. No, I, I, that's, that was the exactly the same thought I had when you were talking about the marketing training for farmers, right? Also there, um, we have 550,000 farmers or farm, farming families in Colombia. That's a huge number, of course, but there will not be 550,000 brands on the market because some mm -hmm. of them are so small that it, it, the effort of doing their own marketing is probably too much uh, overkill and it will not add to the whole to the whole numbers so also there's a certain limitation of like what is the kind of farm size or production output where you can start doing your own um marketing and and where is it better to uh, associate with others build groups become stronger together and then have one person doing marketing for 500 families and it's funny because yeah. like you go in circles right you're like well it'd be good if we could group <laughs> together producers and then you're like, it's like, what well, you just described as a cooperative. It's like, oh, yeah. It's like, well, that exists. It's like, yeah, but we could do it our own way. And then you redo it and you're like, that's almost exactly like these guys do it. <laughs> well, maybe there's a reason why things are structured as they are. I love it, Henry. This is great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it, it's not that complex, right? But uh, you have to sit down and really th think about it and you have to try it. And that's what I appreciate that you do, right? You, you bring people together and enable that learning, enable those opportunities. And from that, we will learn, adapt, and take next steps. Because the same is true for, for markets and for products. What was uh, hip and, uh, and the latest thing five years ago might not be anymore. And same as technology changes, same, same as the world is changing. Um, now we have all those uh, certain fermentation techniques maybe uh, more, more requested, right? Because more people know about it. Uh, maybe others are, are on the way out, who knows? So it's uh, also keeping on top of those those trends and uh, you know get, getting the market and the and, and the producers to move and yeah. well another thing that you drew towards is like we could put a group of producers together right and then they can work together as a unit to have more impactful change or just benefit from scalability. The other thing which we're also seeing in coffee producing countries and in coffee consuming countries is market consolidation and farms basically getting bigger mm -hmm. and i think it's really visible i mean even here at being in colombia is that if, if a producer has a farm and he has six children and in terms of land succession the farm is then a farm which may have been of a sufficient size to support one family is then being expected to support five families or six families and part of it comes down to like what is a minimum say farm size or a minimum operational scale that would that would sustain a family, or as they say in Colombia, coffee producing family. Now, I noticed you said that you didn't say half a million coffee farmers here, half a million coffee fam farming families, because that's how things are set here. I mean, what do you think about that? I never understood why uh, in, in Europe or in Austria at least, uh, the, I think the oldest son got the farm. That was that's how the heritage rule was was set in place, and I thought like some of those farms are really big. You could easily divide them, right? Well, you can do this once, once or twice, but after a certain generation, it's over. If you, if if that's the tradition, you will end with nothing. And I think they saw that already early on, and that's why they put that in place. It's like, it's un, to me, it's it sounds unfair, but I think it's for the survival of the farm and for the survival of the system, it's probably necessary. And do you ever think about like what's a minimum size required for a farm, or does that depend on country or? Man, that's that's a really tough question, actually. <laughs> now reversing, right? Um, well, honestly, it, it depends what you what your product is. I think that's that's with any any other thing. If you're really in into a niche and the highest quality, and you do like really small output but very high quality, you can be small. Uh, but if you go for a, for a, I wouldn't say mass market, but for a bigger market, quantity is necessary and. There, you, I think, probably under three hectares is super hard. 
even on the five might be i think three to five hectares is, is i guess a little bit where where the interesting size starts and that's not big when we talk to brazilian farmers right <laughs> they tell yeah. us like i have 100 hectares and it's like wow it's like no i'm a super small farmer i'm very small it's like yeah, yeah. different production systems different different circumstances in general yeah and also might be different expectations on the producer side how much coffee they want to sell how much money they want to make as well yeah how they operate so we've definitely spoken about the power dynamics um, in past episodes here but i'm wondering now you know with just with the level of accessibility to education and information online um what kind of leverage or power does that put on um on producers now to have more access to the market um, and just have that more, have more visibility, you know, right now the power dynamics are still very centralized in consuming countries, but, um, I mean, what's your take on, on, on the level of accessibility now, um, to change that narrative a bit? Well, I think accessibility information gives people power to make informed decisions. So mm -hmm. not everyone will have to act on the information available, or even consume it, but, but having higher quality information allows people to make more informed decisions, which may better benefit their business in the long run. So partly with Producer Open Forum, the vision is we get the best speakers on specific topics to come and share their expertise. So the producers who are interested can have access to that. And if they want to act on it. Mm. But I think that it's a, it's a difficult question because it comes down to does that person, has that person had the same opportunities to understand what to do with that information as well. So if you're a producer and we have a fantastic lecture about um, accessibility of finance and creative ways which you can be more effective in how you run your coffee farm, to some producer that might be, oh great, they can immediately action that. Other producers, it might be really challenging to, to, to appreciate the context of what's happening. So I think that accessible information is key. And I also think that it's a case, what I had to learn is that when I first started Fairly Grand, I used to like send people articles and be like, you should read this. And they'd be like, I'm good, you know? I'd be like, it's really good, you'll, you'll enjoy this. And people were like, yeah, yeah, I'll check it out later. And then what we, what, what, what we changed, started doing is that we just published the information that those that want to read it will engage with it. Because if someone doesn't see that there's a problem in any, not just in producing countries, in consuming countries, and you propose a solution, then you're wasting your time. And I'm sure that's with the same with technology at the time as well. You could build the most incredible tools to address certain problems, but if you're if you're speaking to somebody who doesn't see a problem, then 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 where are you going with it? And I think I also think that I like to think, and I think I'm seeing it more and more just from my time in Colombia the last month or so, is that there is more the more information that happens. It's not just a one way, um, say, relationship between producing countries and consuming countries and how they're selling their coffee. It's been really interesting to see, particularly in Colombia, the number of farms which are actually roasting and selling their own coffees for the local market. Mm, mm -hmm. So the information, the education information available about roasting, everything that's happening is being transferred and adjusted locally. Oh, yeah. yeah there's a lot happening in, at Origin towards that, uh, like local supply chains, and that, that uh, is, is a massive opportunity in general, learning locally and then going international, right? Sometimes that that's, uh, at least that's what I, that's a saying, I think it's Spanish, right? Uh, before you go out, uh, first learn learn to know your own country. And antes de ir al extranjero, conoce tu país primero. And mm. uh, so it's, it sounds nice in Spanish, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but that's kind of true in some ways. Then again, also I'm, I'm, my my life did not always comply with that i sometimes just went out because i wanted to and did yeah. not always learn the local things first um but it, it's an opportunity because the the ways are shorter right you can go to a coffee shop in your own country easier you can visit a roastery and um i just in november i had the opportunity to drink coffee at a coffee farm uh, which was produced fermented well uh, 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 grown fermented uh milled uh, and roasted and 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 prepared at that same farm, which uh, that coffee never left the farm. It's amazing. It's an amazing experience. Yeah. But it also shows, of course, that producer has um, and and he said he's never left the country. So he he doesn't know about the, the international part of the business or went to fancy trade shows, but he knows everything he needs to know 
to create the perfect coffee in his region and, and on his farm. Huge advantage because he knows all the steps and he knows how to control them. And it comes with knowing your market as well, because with in terms of value retention, we often simplify it. We say, well, I don't have to speak on behalf of the producers, you know, but like, let's say we say, oh, producers should roast and sell their own coffee locally. But, or even if you look at like why a lot of roasters don't buy farms, is because there's lots of other other kind of things you have to take into consideration, you have to right. be mindful of. But like, um, I think that when I'm looking at, um, say, like the idea of like um, far, farmers should sell their coffee locally or they should do these things or roasting should mm. do these things. It really comes down to having a market for your product. And a lot of the time, that's the kind of the first, the very first thing to start with. The same with marketing. It's like, who are you speaking to? Because there's no point investing on a farm and buying a roaster if you don't have anyone who would buy that coffee locally. And similarly, there's no point getting a exploitation license and selling all our infrastructure if there's you haven't got an established market or if there's other barriers in place. Oh, I miss you. I think you don't have to do everything. I mean, getting a coffee farm sounds very nice and very romantic, but it's uh, not It's not like that. And a lot of roasters, I think, have realized that, uh, how hard it is and how, how how much investment and dedication that actually needs. And that's the same for, for many of those things. I would also not recommend to farmers immediately like buy a roaster and, and get roasting. <laughs> There's people doing that, yeah. right? And uh, if, But if your market is big enough, I mean, that's why I mean, if people need marketing um, advice or, or a publication. So they go to Perfect Daily Grind instead of building their own. Mm -hmm. It's like, why, why build it? There's Henry. He does it. So... That's partner. And there's a lot of those things. I don't need to buy, build my own computers. We could, but we don't need to. We buy them and let others. You build computers? No, you could. I mean, you can buy the parts and build your own computers, but it's, it, it makes no sense anymore to do that, right? You get very affordable devices oh. off the shelf and they do everything you need to do. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could build a computer. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the same as you can build your own roasting machine, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah, cool. This was a super exciting and super informative discussion, and really appreciate you sharing your your knowledge and experience on these various topics. And just super nice having you, man. Thank you so much. Well, cheers. Well, thank you very much for having me and for giving me the time as well and for listening. It was Absolutely. wonderful. I, I appreciate it and I hope we talk uh, soon and we also want to know about uh, dates and all the details uh, about the uh, producer roasters absolutely yes we hope you enjoyed this episode of the coffee and technology podcast to learn more about Cropster subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media for more educational content visit cropster.com forward slash learn